today on Real Radio. Remarkable prophecies. The rabbis know this. Every Christian should know this. Every Jew should know this. Their Messiah has come, and he's coming again. Welcome to Real Radio with Pastor Jack Hibbs. I'm David J. thanking you for joining us today as we listen, learn, and are challenged by God's Word, the Bible. On today's edition of Real Radio, Pastor Jack in a message called The Ministry of the Messiah According to the Bible, Part 2, continues a series now called The God of Our Salvation, the book of Isaiah. Thanks for joining us today. You know, Isaiah must have really felt great joy for the many prophecies that God gave him regarding the restoration of his beloved Jerusalem. The Lord's kindness and mercy towards his people and towards all of mankind is undeserved good news. But the restoration of Jerusalem has an even greater fulfillment that is yet to come when Jesus Christ returns to earth in the second coming. In part one of Isaiah chapter 52, we learn that in the last days, many will be deceived into following evil spirits and false teachings. That's why you and I need to be on guard in our Christian walk. There is only one true gospel, and that is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And get this, a remnant of the Jews will come to realize this when God opens their eyes to the truth. So today on day two of chapter 52, Pastor Jack tells us that the Messiah, according to Scripture, doesn't come as a conqueror of the Romans, but as one who must suffer and die on the cross for our sins. His suffering was to the point of being beaten even beyond recognition. This kind of passion points to only one man, God's Son, the Messiah, Jesus Christ. And now, continuing his lesson called The Ministry of the Messiah According to the Bible, Part 2, here's pastor and Bible teacher Jack Hibbs. Psalm 6920 goes on, and I'm full of heaviness. I looked for someone to take pity, but there was none, and for comforters, but I found none. They also gave me gall for my food, and for my thirst, they gave me vinegar to drink. Does that rec- you recognize that anywhere? Church family? Remember, that's Jesus on the cross. That's exactly what happened to him. The suffering ministry of the Messiah is throughout Old Testament scripture. And every Jew should know this. Every rabbi knows it, but they're not telling their people. You and I know it as believers, but the Jews today, they don't study these portions of scriptures And it's remarkable. Daniel chapter 9. Follow with me on the screens or in your Bible. Daniel chapter 9, verse 24. The Bible there tells us that 70 weeks are determined for your people. This is the angel through God speaking to Daniel. 70 weeks or 490, if you want to write this down. 70 weeks, it's uh, Babylonian uh, time, 360 year which your Bible is, it's a hepstad. It means 70 weeks, 490 years is what that means. Watch this. 490 years are determined for your people, that's the Jew, and for your holy city, that's Jerusalem. Number one, according to the ministry of the Messiah, that's prophesied to Daniel. Number one, to finish the transgression. Number two, to make an end of sins. Three, to make reconciliation for iniquity. Four, to bring in everlasting righteousness. Five, to seal up vision and prophecy. That's not happened yet, by the way. Prophe- vision and prophecy is not done. When the, when, the, when the scriptures are fulfilled, then it's done. And to anoint the most holy. That's, the day of, that's what's known as the day of God, when eternity begins. No more sin, no more possibility of sin. That's forthcoming. Verse 25, watch this. So he's saying, Daniel, heads up. Here's a code. Make sure the Jewish people know it. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, that's March 14th, 445 BC. You can read about that in the book of Nehemiah. Until the Messiah, the Prince, there shall be seven weeks, that's 49 years, and 62 weeks, that's 434 years. So if you're doing the math in your head, you got 490, and God tells Daniel, break it up. Out of the 490, there is going to be 49 weeks, or 49 years, 
and another segment, a cluster of events, equaling 434 years. 434 plus 49 is 483 years. But look at the top of the prophecy. God says 490 years are promised to the people and to the holy city for a special work. When you do the math here, it's 483 years. It looks like we've lost seven years somewhere. Something's wrong. Not at all. Watch. It says 490 or 62 weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublesome times. That's the book of Nehemiah, verse 26. And after the 62 weeks, that segment, that cluster, that 434 segment, the Messiah shall be cut off. The word cut off, uh, two words in English, one word in Hebrew. The Messiah shall be killed for committing a capital crime. What? What crime to the Jewish leadership could Jesus have committed that would have required him to die? Say it again. For saying he was God. In your New Testament, you remember when, Jesus, when they say, are you the son of God? He said, it is as you say. And remember, they tore their clothes and they said, we have no more need of anything. That's it. He's done. He's to the cross. He goes. Interesting. That was on the 483rd year from the prophecy of March 14th, 445 BC. 490, you count 483 years according to Daniel's prophecy, and that's April 6, 32 AD, when Christ comes into Jerusalem that week he was crucified. That is pure science. You can't get away from it. If you're a skeptic in the house, you need to go study Sir Isaac Newton, who started this study, he broke it all down. The scientist, you know who he is? Sir Isaac Newton? And then uh, Sir Robert Anderson picked it up and wrote a book. You can buy it anywhere. It's called The Coming Prince by Sir Robert Anderson. Remarkable prophecies. The rabbis know this. Every Christian should know this. Every Jew should know this. Their Messiah has come and he's coming again. And Isaiah is crying out to a people. In fact, can I say Isaiah has been crying out for nearly 3,000 years. Isaiah chapter 50, verse 6. I gave my back to those who struck me. This is a messianic prophecy. Can you think of anybody in history who in context of the Jewish nation, who Hebrew prophets are prophesying, where the Bible says, I gave my back to those who struck me and my cheeks to those who plucked out my beard. I hid... I, hit, I did not hide my face from shame and spitting. Who could that possibly be? So let me read that again. 743 years before he was born, I gave my back to those who struck me and my cheeks to those who plucked out my beard. I did not hide my face from shame and spitting. You would say, well, I don't believe the Bible. All right, but you do know that this event actually took place and you do know that this is recorded in Roman history. You do know that. You do know that Rome was a real place and it was a real empire and that its account of Jesus is a fact and a record of Roman history. And so you have to acknowledge this did not the Bible say that he, the Messiah, when he would come, would be pierced through his hands and his feet? He was pierced through his hands and his feet. The Bible says not one bone of him was allowed to be broken. Did you know that? One thing we know for sure, out of all that Jesus experienced in his 33 and a half years of life, we know this, he never broke a bone in his body because the Bible says that not one bone of the Messiah's body could be broken. Why? Because from Exodus chapter 12 and 13, the Passover lamb could not have any blemishes or broken bones. And the Bible says that when they came to break the legs of the crucified victims, they broke the legs of the... You, the reason why they break the legs is because that's how you breathe. You push up on the, on the nail, fill your lungs, and then relax, and then 
let the air out, then push up on the nail. That's how you breathe. So they broke the legs of the two and they went to Jesus to break his legs, says the Bible, and he was already dead, which revealed a remarkable, remarkable physiological situation that was going on. The Bible says, did you notice that pink colored fluid coming out of him? Why wasn't it red? Because the Bible says that they would pierce on his right side. Bible says right side. The Bible says that his heart would have been pierced and out of his heart came blood mingled with water. Which is very interesting and extremely rare because that means the pericardial sac of round that surrounds your heart, Jesus's had been filling up with so much water, which means this, that Jesus was suffering beyond what they had ever known anyone to suffer like that before. His heart was actually breaking and being crushed by this amount of water that was basically strangling his heart for us. Christopher Hitchens wants to talk about a maniacal, mean, ugly God. If our God was maniacal, mean, and ugly, then you and I would be on that cross. Atheists miss the whole story. And you'll miss the whole story if you don't know his word. Zechariah chapter 13, verse 6. I'm going to give you this in numerous versions because, it, I don't know, it ministered to me in an awesome way. And this is a great lesson for all of us Bible students. Get, get your Bible ready. Turn to Zechariah. It's a little bit beyond Isaiah. Just keep going to the right, going to the right. Depends on what Bible version you have. You may have New King James or NIV or ESV, whatever you've got. Watch this. The translators struggle with this and the, and the publishers of your Bible. You know, you have Zondervan. I don't know who you have. Zondervan, Ryrie, uh, you know, Tyndale, publishers. Some publishers you need to stay away from. Zechariah 13, verse 6. This is the King James Version. Watch this. Now follow along with me. And one shall say unto him, What are these wounds in thine hands? And then he shall answer those with which I, and he, was, he went on to say, was wounded in the house of my friends. Notice the word hands. See that? And the previous slide, King James Version says hands. Okay? Zechariah 13, 6, in the New King James Version and the New American Standard Bible says, and one will say to him, what are these wounds between your arms? Then he will answer, those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. You see the difference? King James says hands. New King James and New American Standard says arms. Zechariah 13, verse 6 in the NIV, the New International Version, NIV. Maybe you have an NIV. It says, if someone asks, what are these wounds on your body? They will answer the wounds I was given at the house of my friends. So we go from hands, arms, body. Zechariah 3.16 ESV, the English Standard Version. And if anyone asks him, what are these wounds on your back? He will say, the wounds I received in the house of my friends. So we go from hands, arms, body, back. The New Living Translation, Zechariah 13, verse 6. And if someone asks, then what about these wounds on your chest? He will say, I was wounded at the house of my friends. Just normally when you see words changed like this in versions of the Bible, uh, you just want to study more and you want to go back to various manuscripts because that's, that's the point of origin. Uh, by the way, that's why, one of the reasons why the Dead Sea Scrolls is so wonderfully important to us. Here's a precious thing about Zechariah 13, 6. And let me tell you again. Hands? What are these wounds in your hands? What are these wounds in your arms? What are these wounds in your body? What are these wounds on your back? What are these wounds on your chest? You know why the translators 
have different words there? Because the Hebrew word is so difficult to translate. The King James translators, they were brilliant. They said, now wait a minute, they're gonna ask what are these wounds in your hands? Now, I have to tell you, I've told you this before, you guys, that the hand, when the Bible talks about hand, this, it's, see my sleeves, I was like, that's about, in the Bible, that's a hand from about here out. See, you and I think this is a hand, right? This is an actual hand. It goes hand and then forearm and then the bicep area. So the King James translators are extremely accurate and they built that argument based upon the 22nd Psalm. They will pierce my hands and my feet, right? So they're right on, no doubt about it. But listen, the new King James and the new American Standard Version, they said arms because the Bible here suggests in Isaiah 52, 53, you read it a moment ago, that he was marred more than any man. It means that he was shredded. I mean, I don't mean this disrespectful, but imagine just lashing a, a human body to the point where there's no recognition except the shape of it that it's a human. So when they used the word arms, they were being accurate. They were accurate. You say, well, yeah, but Pastor Jack, I've got an NIV. And it says the word body. Hey, those guys, they looked at the same scriptures and said, you know what? He was pierced, he was beaten, head to toe, body. The word marred, his visage, human appearance, destroyed. They were correct. ESV says my back. Isaiah says he gave his back to the smiters. He was shredded. That's accurate. New Living says chest. All accurate. What's the point? This is the price that was paid for your sins and mine. Jesus was completely mangled. According to the Bible, the Messiah of Israel and the Savior of the world had to first suffer before he could offer you salvation. Tell your Jewish friends that. Tell your Muslim friends that. And Christian, if you know that in your head, do you know it in your heart? And listen, I'm gonna ask Gia to come on out. We're gonna end a little early in some worship. And I'm gonna ask you, I know we don't have carpet yet. We're gonna dim the lights. I'm gonna ask you if you just wanna privately take this moment. You saw Mel Gibson's representation of the price that was paid for you. But you know what? Maybe tonight is a night when you just wanna just stand up or get on your knees or come forward down here as a believer. Or maybe you wanna become a believer, it doesn't matter. But you would say tonight, if you're gonna do this, you're gonna say, Jesus, thank you so much. Thank you so much. And Lord, I worship you. Let's just end right now with some worship and thanks that the God who died on the cross for you loved you and paid a price for you that you would not have to go to hell but be forgiven and be with him in heaven forever. And that is worthy of our praise. And for some, it's worthy for, of our rededication of our lives. So let's, let's, let's worship right now together. And you come on up, or you stand, or you kneel. I don't know if this is, uh, if it was me, if it's a thought that entered my head, or if it's from God. You judge, you be the judge. But I think I'm just supposed to say tonight to whoever this applies to, that if you're a husband here tonight with your wife, God wants you to dedicate your marriage to God tonight anew and afresh. God wants husbands to love on their wives and to protect them, to lead them, to serve them. And maybe tonight you and your wife can get on your knees or stand up or come forward, but maybe tonight God is, is the one speaking this to you, that maybe you have an awesome marriage and you want to keep it awesome and keep it safe. Because you know what? Weird things are going on in people's lives. And I know for my own life personally, I want to galvanize my marriage against this freakish world. Maybe tonight your marriage is okay, but it could do better. Or maybe tonight you're just saying, you know what, our marriage is not so hot. We need to just give it back to God. Nobody needs to know the reason. It's none of their business. It's all about you and God. But I'm telling you right now, maybe tonight is the night that God wants 
us to say, Lord, we, we come to you as a couple tonight. We come to you as one, especially for the man to lead the way in ser- service and in ministry to his wife, to be, as it were, the Jesus in the home. That's what the husband's supposed to be. Maybe tonight is the night for you. If God is speaking to anyone else, of course, respond to what he's telling you about. But I just felt strong that I needed to say that tonight. I ask you to stand if you would. Let's all stand together right where you're at. And I ask you to join me. Let's raise our hands to the Lord. And we're just going to extend our hearts to him right now. We are going to be accountable before him right now and the angels that are looking in on this moment to those that are around us. Maybe the husband or the wife might be here with your child or your parents. But as followers of Jesus, Would you join with me out loud in saying this? I come to you, Lord, and I humble myself. I ask for your forgiveness. I ask for your healing to be upon my life. Tonight, I make you this vow that from this moment forward, I will yield to you, Lord. I will obey you, for I know that you love me and that you purchased me on the cross and that you rose from the dead so that no weapon would be able to conquer me. Thank you, Lord. Fill me now with your Holy Spirit. Baptize me afresh. In Jesus' name, I thank you, Lord. Amen. Pastor and Bible teacher, Jack Hibbs here on Real Radio, in a message called The Ministry of the Messiah According to the Bible, Part 2. Thanks for listening today. You know, for Jesus to willingly suffer such a horrible death in our place shows us just exactly how much He loves us. Won't you come to Him today? The Ministry of the Messiah According to the Bible, Part 2, is part of Pastor Jack's series called The God of Our Salvation, the Book of Isaiah, a series that brings to light the ministry of the Old Testament prophet Isaiah who shared with us the coming of the Messiah, our Lord Jesus Christ, over 700 years before he was born. And we'll continue on the next edition of Real Radio. You know, when Pastor Jack was asking how confident you are in your salvation, were you able to give an answer? Do you really know without a doubt what it means to be saved? If you still have some questions regarding salvation, we can help. Simply go to our website, reallifewithjackhibbs.org, and click on the tab there labeled Know God. That's the No God tab. And when you do, you'll find out what it means to give your life to Jesus Christ. We're not here by accident, and you're not listening by accident. The Lord wants you to know who you are in Him so you can trust Him to lead you on the right path and rely on Him in all that you do. And be sure to let us know about your decision for Christ. We'd love to hear it. And if you have any questions or concerns, give us a call, 877-777-2346. It's all right there at our website, reallifewithjackhibbs.org. That's reallifewithjackhibbs.org or on the Real Life app. And if you need to get a hold of us, call us, 877-RR-RADIO. That's 877-777-2346. This program is made possible by the generous contributions of you, our listeners. Visit us at reallifewithjackhibbs.org. That's reallifewithjackhibbs.org. I'm David J. Until next time, Pastor Jack Hibbs and all of us here at Real Radio wish for you solid and steady growth in Christ and in His Word. We'll see you next time here on Real Radio.